Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angels to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. And here's the blessing. Blessed is he who reads this morning, that is me who is reading, and those who hear, that is you who are hearing, the words of this prophecy. And then notice, and keep, meaning to study and obey, those things which are written in it. And here's the reason. For the time is near. Now, we understand as we approach this book of Revelation that it is a revelation to us who are his servants and who are all in for Jesus Christ. But when we look around the world today, we can all agree that the time is near. So this revelation is for us as an encouragement and a blessing that comes with peace, knowing the things that must shortly take place. God gives us the gift of this book as a comfort that brings forth the divine conclusion to the inspired word of God that we have in the Bible and knowledge of all that will happen and how it all ends. That is, God wins. With this knowledge, this book is to shape our lives as Christians to produce a response of walking in obedience, right, by the Holy Spirit, as we wait with expectations, watching for Jesus and the fulfillment of God's promise of eternal victory. Now this morning, as we begin our study, John continues his introduction by greeting the seven churches that this letter is being written to. Just like the other letters that are written, he still follows what is custom in that culture when writing a letter. In verses 4 and 5, as we pick up on Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, he begins with who is writing the book and says, John. Now, John is the last living apostle at this time. All the other apostles have been martyred for Jesus Christ, and they are now with the Lord. And he is the last eyewitness of Jesus Christ. And really, all he had to do was introduce himself and, and just right at the top of the whole letter is the elder. Everyone within the church would have known who, who the elder was because he was it. He was that last living apostle. Everyone else had died before they, they reached their 60s. And he was in his late 80s and was the last one standing. But he connects, right, no title with his name. He was sent. John, who the Lord was using to write down all things that the Lord was revealing to him. John was the vessel. So he, he simply is who he is when he writes this, John. Yet there was no question as well who John was in the church either. So again, he writes John, but I love the idea that he doesn't connect anything, no title, no nothing, just, hey, I'm a servant of the Lord. And he is writing this letter to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now, concerning the seven churches, don't think of Asia as in the Orient, like in China or Japan. He is referring to what was known as Asia in the area of the Roman Empire, what we know to be, for us, modern-day Turkey. And to be more specific, it's southwestern Turkey. So John mentions the seven churches here, and Jesus will get into a list of these specific churches in in verse 11. uh, And we'll get to that in our study soon. But the question may be posed, and I'm going to address it now, concerning the seven churches is this. If this letter was directed specifically to those churches, how are we supposed to apply it to ourselves today? Well, look how clear the Holy Spirit makes it. In verse 3, that any Christian or believer can read this revelation and be blessed by it. But later in chapter 2 and 3, as Jesus closes out all his letters to the individual churches, to each one of those seven churches, he writes in his closings, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
meaning these words are not only intended for the specific churches, but that they are also intended for all churches. Now, if you look at verse 4, 7 is mentioned for the first time. And it is going to be mentioned 54 times in this book. So why is 7 significant? Well, because the number 7 in the Bible is known as the number of completion. That was the number uh, that has been categorized by the Jews, you know, all the way back to creation when God created the heavens and the earth and rested on the seventh day. There are seven days in a complete week, just like there are seven colors of the rainbow of God's covenant, where God promises to never flood the earth again. And no matter when we see it, either during in the rain or if you're watering your lawn, you see a rainbow or during a storm, there's a rainbow in the distance or from whatever angle that you look at, you will always see the same seven colors in the same order. And in this book, you will see seven used with seven churches, seven spirits, seven horses, and the list goes on. But just so you know, seven is known as the number of completion. Now, back to the seven churches that John is writing to, he writes to the churches which are in Asia. The historical churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, where he did a lot of his ministry in his day and was the pastor of Ephesus and had oversight of all the churches in that area. They were all about 50 miles apart from one another. And these seven churches, here's where we're getting at, represent the complete condition of the church worldwide and individually like ours, or other churches in Clarksville, or any church around the world. And we will learn about this in chapters 2 and 3. But on a side note, if you want to take just kind of a little side note, Paul also wrote letters to seven churches. He wrote to the church at Rome, to the church at Galatia, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Colossae, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Philippi, and the church at Corinth. All having problems that any church at any time in history would have to face. But to these seven historical churches that John writes to in Revelations, these represent the complete condition of the church worldwide, that we are to read and have ears to hear what the Spirit says, as in, is presently saying to the churches. And the church, through our history and to our present age, are to listen because the Spirit is still saying what he is saying. Then on top of that, out of the seven churches, four of them have the promise of Christ's return. So we know those churches still are existent today. That's us. On top of that, if you read the words, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, the word he or him is also speaking to the individual singularly. So this is for the Christians individually, worldwide, from here to around the world at any given point in church history. It's not just the church. It's, it's for us individually. Because let me ask you this. Take a second, just bear with me, and look around the room. Just take a look. Look everywhere. It's right. Now let me ask you, does the church have one big giant ear in the room? Stop looking around. <laughs> the answer is no. But you as believers have ears. The Lord wants you to listen up individually to what the Spirit says to the churches. And use the churches as a mirror to search your individual hearts. This was, what, this was for the churches back then. This was for the churches throughout the ages. And this is for the church today and for the believers in the church individually who has ears to listen. So he writes, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Now one more other important thing so we don't miss, especially in the times we are in, is understanding the word church in this context. The word for church is the word ecclesias, 
which means the assembly of the called. In our recent years, we have seen where churches were forced to close their doors, where many Christians turned to watching online services. The problem is, is that even though the doors are open, there are some who now believe that the church is mainly needed for new Christians. That if you are a, a mature Christian, you don't need to go to church. Home fellowships are enough. Watching online is enough and are more important than the Sunday assembly of the church. Now, I know there's this author that I, I really like. His name is Gene Edwards. He's one of the writers of one of my favorite books called The Tale of Three Kings. And he's an American house church planner who echoes this same sentiment now that if you're a mature Christian, you don't have to go to church when you can meet in homes, however you see fit. And, and I get it, you know, we meet at home for Bible study. I mean, even we started this fellowship as a home fellowship. But the church is the ecclesia. We are called out from the world to be together. And I'll just give you some points just so we can look at just as Jesus said in John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. That a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So there is a dem demonstration of that even in a room this size. There's a demonstration that is going on in this room with all the different folks from all different places where people can come. They will see this truth in demonstration. Paul writes to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and tells him, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of truth, as we should be. Where, where when people come to the church, they will hear the truth being taught at the pulpit and being spoken out by his people. Even the writer of the book of Hebrews says, in chapter 10, verse 24, he says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, by exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So we are called as the body of Christ under the authority of Jesus, who is the head of the body, to assemble together as family. We are the children of God. Wherever the churches are around the world, it is necessary that we meet. I mean, where else can someone go who is lost? to find truth. Who, where else can anyone else go who, who wants to be among people that can demonstrate the love of Christ individually and as of a body of believers? People who have reached that point in their life where they are searching for truth, you know, where they have just kind of reached that point where they're like so tired of the same old, same old, they get up one morning and they're like, I need to go to church. That's something that's just within their own conscience in their mind. I need to go to church. And they want to see these people who have something that they're, not, you know, that they're missing within their own life. Someone who was radically changed for Jesus. Church is not just for new Christians. Church is the ecclesia, the assembly of Christ's body. So don't let anyone tell you that you are immature if you go to church. It's necessary. It's what God has planned for us, knowing the day is approaching. We need one another to pray for each other, to encourage one another, to stir one another up, to, you know, to, to gather, and we can all be unified in agreement in the hope that we have that is in Jesus Christ. We are the ecclesia, the body of Christ. That is the church. And for the record, it doesn't mean that I am against home fellowships. That's not what I'm saying. So don't send me an email. <laughs> so back to verse 4. He says, John to the seven churches 
which are in Asia. Now, if you notice, John does the standard greeting. We'll see in letters with the words, grace to you and peace. We have seen this greeting throughout the letters of Paul. And this was the common greeting during that time. They say grace to you or they'll say peace to you. Now, grace was a term used by the Gentiles to greet one another. And it is the Greek word charis, grace, as in may your day bring you more grace than you deserve. And then there is peace, which is is the standard greeting of the Jews. Peace as in shalom. May your day be filled with peace. Today, I wish we were just that simple. But we're like, what's up? Or hello. And then it comes with, how are you? And it just keeps going. Well, I hope you have a good day. Well, that's pretty much saying peace or grace. You know, have a good day, right? We, we complicate things. I don't know. But, but I want to point out that the Holy Spirit, as we see so often in the New Testament, always keeps this greeting in this order. And it's never in reverse. It is always grace first and peace second. And what the Holy Spirit communicates is an important truth when doing so. Because no one is able to experience the peace of God before they experience the grace of God. It is when we are saved by grace that we have peace with God. And this continues in our relationship with God as believers. We will never have true peace in our relationship with God if we do not know that God deals with, deals with us on the basis of grace. It is only that I am strong in his grace towards me as his child and his grace towards me as a sinner that I will enjoy peace in my relationship with God. This truth, as simple as it sounds, It's not easy for us sometimes to grab hold of it. But when fully understood, it's a game changer. It can absolutely change a Christian's life, especially for someone who has a legalistic background. Our relationship is solely based upon God's grace, and it is only because of God's grace that we can have true peace in this relationships. And notice in the latter part of verse 4 and into 5, John then shares with us the source of, of our grace and peace. Grace and peace does not come from this world, nor is it something made from man, to include the apostles, but that grace and peace have their origin. They come from God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. And all three persons of the Godhead are in complete unity of this grace-based relationship with God, three in one. And the enjoying the peace that comes from the relationship. So John, he says, grace to you and peace from him, speaking of the Father, and describes him as him who is and who was and who is to come. God the Father, he's eternal. He's outside of time. He is all these things in fullness, all at once. Then John describes the Holy Spirit as from the seven spirits who are before his throne. You may read this and go, well, what does that mean? Seven spirits, you know, before his throne? Like I said last week in our last teaching, the key to understanding a lot of revelation is having the understanding of the Old Testament. So now here is where we have to go back to the key and, and ask ourselves, Is there any place in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit is spoken of in the context of seven? And the answer is yes. It is found in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, and I will read it to you. It says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, referring to Jesus. And here we go, verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So here we have seven. The sevenfold fullness of the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of Yahweh, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And we will talk about this when we get to chapter 3, 
when the Lord is dealing with the church at Sardis. And finally, we have this relationship of grace and peace through and from, verse 5, Jesus Christ. Now, in verses 5 through 7, John now aligns himself back to the title of the book, the, back to the theme of this chapter, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and describes Jesus in verse 5, take a look, as the faithful witness. If you look at John's writings, he writes that he is the singular faithful witness of God the Father. He is the singular faithful witness of what God the Father is like. Jesus explained this to Philip in John chapter 14, verse 9, when Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is the singular faithful witness of God the Father. If you want to know what the Father is like, look at Jesus. When you study Jesus, you are studying the Father. You see the compassionate heart of the Father through Jesus. You hear the Father speak when Jesus teaches. You see the Father in action, in his actions, towards people and how he spoke to people. You see perfection. Jesus is the faithful witness to God the Father. No person, no church, no other thing or what anything that anybody can come up with is the faithful witness of God the Father. Only Jesus is, period. Amen. Yet so often... You hear people give excuses of why they don't want to come to the Lord. This being the main one, I'll throw out there. I don't want to become a Christian because the church is full of hypocrites. Well, join the club, you know, because we have room for one more, you know. I would love to see what you would bring to the church, buddy, you know, with you being so different. But, I mean, as Christians, we shouldn't be hypocrites. I get that, right? However, we fall short. We are not perfect. Only Jesus is, which is why this relationship is based on grace, not what we can do, not of our own actions. We fall short. But that is the problem with using this excuse because using the people of the church as, and their witness as your reason for rejecting God's promised Savior in his son Jesus is to take your eyes off the faithful witness of God who is perfection, period. It's, it's important that if you try, and this is to the person who wants to use the church as an excuse, if you try to find excuses and reasons not to follow Jesus, that you do it on the basis of Jesus himself, not on the people. You must try to find something wrong, some fault, or some flaw in Jesus. And I will tell you this, that is something that no one will ever find. And when it's all said and done, there's not one man in this world that you will have to answer to. But there is the Son of Man, the faithful witness that you will have to answer to. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to point. And that is Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord. John then describes Jesus further in verse 5 as the firstborn from the dead. This doesn't mean Jesus was the first ever to rise from the dead. No. And I'll explain. But to understand why this is important is the firstborn in the Old Testament was a position of prominence in the family. All right? It signified someone unique and special within the family. Here's what I meant by he wasn't the first to rise from the dead. Jesus was the first one to be resurrected with an everlasting body. Not back to an earthly body, being raised from the dead, still in his old body. He was the first to be resurrected with an everlasting body. And his resurrection provides a victory over death to all who believe in his name and are born again through the Spirit. 
John then says that he is the ruler over the kings of the earth. He is 100% sovereign. He is ruler over all kings and rulers of the earth. It is the present reality. It is true right now. He reigns sovereign. And one day in the future, and this is all getting to, right? This truth will manifest when he returns as the king of kings and the Lord of lords when he establishes his kingdom age. Then John describes Jesus in verse 5 by saying, to him who loved us. And John, John's use of loved us is in the sense of loves us. It is the agape love. It is the unconditional and it is the continual love. And how, we, how do we know uh, he loves us? By his demonstration on the cross of Calvary. John tells us how we know that he loves us in the next phrase because he freed us via the, via the cross. And through the cross, look what it says, he washed us from our sins in his own blood so that we may enter into his kingdom. He washed away the deep stain of sin from our lives so that we can stand before him in his presence, clean, but in his own blood. It was the ultimate sacrifice. But I want you to notice the order here. It was first love and then washed. He didn't wash us first out of kind of duty, like, oh, before you, I got to I get, get you clean before you come near me. No, that's not what he did. We don't have to be perfect to be loved by the Lord. God loves us first as we are and as we were before we came to Christ you think back, right? We were filthy. We were dirty. We were stained with sin. And then he washed us. He loved us first, and then he washed us. I want you to take a second and think about that. Just pause for a second. Think about how much he loves you. That much. With the Lord's constant love and the heart that he has towards us, and to you individually. I'm going to go back to what I said last week. This book should not frighten you because of the very fact that it is from our Lord who loves us. Amen? And it is by his love and cleansing that he, look at verse 6, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So by his blood, he has made us a part of his kingdom as kings and priests. And when you think about that, it would have been just enough to be loved and be cleansed by him. But to go above that and make us kings and priests to his God and Father, this is more than what Adam was in the garden before he even sinned. You never read in God's word of Adam being a king and a priest of God. You don't read that. But we are kings, and we are God's royalty. We are his royalty. This is a privilege given to us, along with status and authority. We are his ambassadors to the world, and we are priests. God's special servants, where we have special access to God's presence. Now, in the Old Testament, priests, they had two functions. They represented God before the people, and they represented the people before God. So do we. In our Christian lives, as we live them day in and day out, we represent God to the people as his priests. We are his servants. But we also represent the people before God as we intercede for them, as we serve them and pray for these people to God. Jesus made us a kingdom of priests And in royalty, we're all going to reign with him. And with all of who Jesus is, John praises the one to be praised and says, to him be glory and dominion. Now, to recognize the dominion of Jesus is to let him rule over us. In other words, for us to say to him, be glory and dominion, we must 
give him dominion of ourselves entirely. Entirely. Body, soul, and spirit. All three kingdoms within us should be united under his dominion, which would make Christ the king over all and over our hearts. Listen, loved ones. We are not to allow ourselves to take any branch of those three kingdoms to ourselves. We are not to allow ourselves to take any branch of those three kingdoms to ourselves. I know there may be those areas of pain or hurt that we have so greatly been really uh, good at to compartmentalize these things pretty deep within us. An area where we have found a way in our own minds to keep to ourselves and give Jesus the remainder. But I'm just keeping that. Because that makes me comfortable by my standard. And we have learned to always keep that part buried. Just far deep away. It's still within you, but we bury it so deep in a darkened area where it becomes numb. But it's still there. It's a scar. And we tend to think, being that it is hidden so deep, that it's surrounded by these walls now that you've got around them, that, oh, you've got the perfect place, you know, where we can suppress it and not think about it. And, hey, this is what we have learned to cope with. And, yes, it's what helps us function. And I, and I know this, and I'm speaking from experience because I had done that in my life for 25 years. But little did I know the bondage that I was still under. Little did I know how much I was really in control when I thought I was surrendered to Jesus until he revealed it to me that he wanted all of me, including the pain I buried beneath the scar. He revealed to me that in order for me to experience the complete fullness of him in my life, I needed to surrender it all, including that part to him and allow him complete dominion over my life. Finally, I gave it to him. I prayed and I just I allowed him to take it, take all of me and especially all that was beneath the scar. And you know what he did? He was faithful and he set me free. And for the first time in a long time, I felt the fullness of him fall upon me And fill that deep wound, that deep scar that was within me. He filled that with the fullness of him as well. Now he has all of me. I truly have missed out on so much, but I'm thankful that he has all of me. And I'm here to tell you, he wants all of you as well. Remember, nothing is hidden from him. We stand naked before him, scars and all. He's ready to set you free. If you are struggling with this, I'm here to tell you, he's ready for you to release it to him so that you may be set free and may experience the fullness of his love where you will stand and declare to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. The phrase forever and ever is not known in the classic Greek. I thought that was interesting. because It means ages to ages, yet it is listed 14 times in the book of Revelation. He saved us to the ages to ages of the ages. And then John gives the affirmation. He says, amen. That's the truth. So be it. Jesus will be praised. Verse 7, John says, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. So Jesus is going to descend from heaven, and this speaks of his second coming, where every eye will witness him as he comes. And we will go in greater depth than that in chapter 19. But now when John mentions he's coming with clouds, I think of Matthew when he quotes Jesus during the Olivet Discourse. And said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, he says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. This is Jesus speaking. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. 
And they, here we go, will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I want you to keep that in mind because when Jesus comes, he will be surrounded with clouds. This will be literally happening as he was taken up into a cloud at his ascension. He would return in the same manner. But what's interesting, this is where I want to draw your guys' attention in the way that uh, John speaks and even the way Jesus spoke uh, in that verse is clouds are commonly associated with God's presence and glory. And in the Old Testament, the cloud of glory is called the Shekinah glory. All right? Hold that thought. Because also, clouds are figurative. I uh, can't even say the word. Someone help me out. Figurative. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not even going to try it, but you guys got it. But the cloud, you know, I practice that word. I'm just being straight up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's the twang or the twang. I don't get it. But they are described as a multitude of believers. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the writer declares, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Hmm. Understanding these connections with the glory of God and the cloud of witnesses, speaking of the multitude, it is fitting and wonderfully amazing that the multitude of believers is called the cloud, where God's people are his glory. They are his cloud, his Shekinah. Remember, once, once he calls the bride to himself, we will always be with him. So at his second coming, guess who's going to be with him? We will be with him. We will never leave his side. We will always be with him. So when you see it from this point, as you see this Jesus coming in with, with, look back at the verse, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. We see Jesus say that, uh, that the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So you put that together, the way it connects that we, we will be that, that multitude that comes with him. It will be that his glory with, that, with him as he comes back to this earth. And every eye will see him, both Jew and Gentile. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn him because of him. And the reaction is that they will mourn when they see him. Right? The reaction is that they will more, mourn when they see him at the second coming. And it is both Jew and Gentile who were involved in Jesus' crucifixion. Now, I want you to keep also one other thing in mind. There will be new born-again believers who get saved during the tribulation that survived not having been martyred for their faith. And when they see him, they will rejoice. But first, as we see in this scripture, they will mourn because of their first reaction towards Jesus before the tribulation. You understand? They spent all their life rejecting him, but yet they, in, in, in during the tribulation, they come to him. And when they see him, they'll mourn him because they're going to be like, oh man, that's Jesus. I'm so thankful. And then they're going to rejoice, praise God. You know, praise, praise Jesus. He's, he's, he's come for us, you know. And so there will be that, that mourning uh, and, and then it'll turn to joy. But on the flip side, there will be those who remain alive in the tribulation who were completely hostile towards Christ and the believers. But when they see him, they will mourn knowing they have no legs to stand on to judge him. Not anymore. And they will now be judged by him. And John declares at the end of verse 7, he says, even so, amen. Meaning that's the truth. Let's get on with it. Now, I will close with verse 8, because then in verse 8, when you look at your Bibles, you see red letters, meaning we have a change of speaker here. It goes from John to Jesus himself. Here, Jesus declares of himself in verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In this verse, Jesus declares three things to the church about himself, and they are very wonderful. 
First, he is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. He is the beginning and the end. All right? He is sovereign. He has authority over everything, of all things. Second, who is and who was and is to come, he is Yahweh. He is eternal. Thirdly, the Almighty, as in he has all might, that no one or no thing will have any hope of resisting what occurs in this revelation. Now, Jesus is altogether telling us of his deity, that he is God. And we understand this by learning from the Old Testament. We know that the Alpha and Omega, the first and last, and the beginning and the end, is an Old Testament declaration by God, Yahweh, Jehovah, that he is God. That's what he uses, right? Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, says, Who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first, and with the last, I am he is what God says. So in verse 8, Jesus declares himself the Alpha and the Omega. He's ascribing deity to himself. Now, there is a debate uh, where people ask, is this Jesus who is speaking in verse 8, or is this the Father who's speaking in verse 8? Well, to me, I understand this to be Jesus because this revelation is about Jesus, and verse 7 and 9 are about Jesus. So this would be an odd place for the Father to insert himself and declare to the church all about himself. But it would be more natural with the flow of this introduction for it to be Jesus to come and speak here. Now, there are those, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, who try to explain this as being God the Father that is speaking here, and not Jesus, because Jehovah's Witnesses, they do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And so they will say this refers to God the Father here, thinking it solves their problems. However, the problem becomes, and is, is that it only buys them enough time from verse 8 of being the Father who is speaking until the time they reach verse 11. Because in verse 11, Jesus declares himself to be the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, And we know for sure that it is Jesus who's saying it there because John will turn around, he hears the voice, he will turn around, and he will see Jesus standing there in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And then he will further describe the revelation of what he saw of Jesus. So I believe verse 8 is in fact Jesus who is speaking, declaring who he is. Now let's reread. Verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, or the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, as we close, verses 4 through 8 was a very beautiful greeting to the church. It was a wonderful greeting to us, amen? And it was from John, and it was from the Revealer and the Revelation, Jesus Christ. But the main thing that we need to remember is how he says that he loves you. He loves you so much that he died for you on the cross so that you, just as you were, were washed by his own blood that brought you into this wonderful grace-based relationship with him and were made a king and a priest of God the Father. But that you should know above all else 
is that the Lord sees you as his child. And just like any other father, right, he protects his child. He wants you to know who is in control. He loves you that much that he does not want you to be afraid of anything that follows after this greeting. He speaks and tells you who he is as a reminder. He is God Almighty. He is our peace through grace. Remember, this book comes with a blessing where we begin with Jesus, and it is for sure we will finish with Jesus. It only gets better from here this point on. Amen? Let us pray. Lord.